Hello and welcome to this service of worship from St Helens and St Peter's churches in Wheat Hampstead. My name's Barbara and I'm a member of the ministry team here at St Helens and I'm sitting in the churchyard outside the south door of the church on what's a calm morning. I don't know what it's been like where you are but we've had a lot of fierce wind this week um, as Storm Francis has passed over us. And we've been reading in the news this morning about other storms and hurricanes that are rapidly approaching the coast of um, the south of the United States. So we hope and pray that wherever you are, you are safe at the moment. But when we hear the sound of the wind rushing around us, as we've done this week, it's a powerful reminder that wind is a strong metaphor for the Spirit of God. We read in the book of Acts that when the Spirit appeared for the first time to the disciples, it came as a rush, the rush of a mighty wind. And I always think of that story when I hear the sound of the wind around us. So as we begin our worship this morning, let's take the opportunity to come into God's presence and think about the Spirit as a breath, rather than um, a rushing, dangerous, destructive force. Let's think about the Spirit as the breath of life that fills us and gives us new, new life and new joy as we come to worship. So what I'll ask you to do with me this morning is to find a comfortable spot and to take three breaths slowly in and out. So with me, a breath for the Father who created us. A breath for this Son who redeemed us. And a breath for the Spirit who sustains us. So we come into the presence of God who is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And I hope you will join with me in singing our first hymn, Breathe on me, breath of God. Breathe. 
Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Truly, I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I wonder what it is that motivates you. What's your motivation in life? For me, that question could be answered in lots of different ways. For instance, what motivates me to get up early every morning? Well, the simple answer to that is that I enjoy the peace and quiet of having the house to myself before anybody else in the household gets up. What will motivate me to lose the lockdown stone? The knowledge that my winter clothes fit that more t much more tightly than my summer clothes. But what about the bigger questions in life? What motivates me when it comes to money? What motivates me when it comes to my lifestyle? What motivates me when I think about jobs? What motivates me as I look to the future? Behind all these separate questions, which might have lots of different answers, lies, I think, a set of values which determine my general outlook in life and drives all other motivations. In our Gospel reading today, we hear Jesus being very stark in his challenge to firstly Peter and then to everyone. Stark in his challenge of where our motivation lies. What is at the heart of what we do and the decisions we make? Jesus knows what's coming. He knows that he will suffer and be killed when he goes to Jerusalem. But in trying to explain this to his closest friends, Peter, quite understandably, jumps to Jesus' defence. God forbid it, Lord! This must never happen to you. Peter's response is motivated by a deep love for his friend Jesus, but also out of a sense that this is deeply wrong. No one should suffer and be killed. Jesus' response to Peter is quite shocking. He says, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block for me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. What a crushing response to receive when you are simply leaping to your friend's defence. But Jesus knew what he had to do. He knew that this was a path he needed to follow. He knew that however hard it was going to be, he would have to put 
other things before the preservation of his own life. I've often wondered whether the strength of Jesus' response to Peter, which can seem really harsh, was in fact an indication of how hard following this path was already for Jesus. Is this a foretaste of the inner conflict Jesus found himself battling with in the Garden of Gethsemane as his suffering, his trial and his execution were about to take place? In that garden, we find Jesus crying out, Father, take this cup from me. Even Jesus, both fully human and fully God, struggled with surrendering all to God's will. As Jesus tries to explain to his closest friends what was going to happen, he couldn't allow himself to be diverted as it would be all too easy to turn and follow a different, seemingly easier path. It would be all too easy to be tempted in another way. At the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he spent 40 days in the wilderness, facing all sorts of temptations. Temptations to take the seemingly easier path. He stood firm then, as he stood firm when Peter tried to give him a different option, a seemingly easier way. He stood firm in the Garden of Gethsemane, saying, but not my will, Lord, but yours. Jesus knew that his motivation was doing God's will, in following God's path, rather than any other. And this is the challenge he makes to every one of us. Jesus said, if anyone wants to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. It is a challenge to surrender all to God, to be solely motivated by him, to deny our own desires, our own wants, and to instead be purely made, motivated by God's values and by his will. But that is why it's such a stark challenge, to lose our life for God. But in doing so, Jesus, pro Jesus promises us that we'll find it again. Elsewhere in the Gospels, Jesus promises us that he came so that we could have life and life in all its fullness. When we give our life to God, when we are motivated by his values, his will, then we are promised a life which will be full. So we have a choice to make, not just once, but every day, just as Jesus did. A choice to follow our own desires or to follow God's. That is our choice, to follow God's path or our own. But how do we do that on a daily basis? How do we know what God's will is? How do we tell whether God's will, God's desire, is the same as ours? How do we know if we're in tune with God's thinking or whether we're wandering off, finding our own way instead? Now to answer that properly could be a whole series of sermons, but I offer just three really simple suggestions today. Firstly, values. Are our motivations based and rooted in the values which we see in Jesus' life? Are we loving our neighbour as much as we love ourselves? 
Are we living a life of forgiveness? Are we seeking after things that Jesus sought after? So firstly, values. Secondly, pray. Talk to God about your own thoughts, your own desires. Ask him for his wisdom and guidance. Maybe ask him to give you a sense of peace when you have come to a decision that is in accordance with his will. And finally, and thirdly, talk to others. Use others who you trust and who are also trying to seek God's way to help you determine what God's way is for you. So what motivates us in life? Well, the challenge of today's gospel reading is to make that motivation God. That is not an easy choice to make, as it wasn't easy for Jesus. But it is a life-giving choice, a choice to live life in all its fullness, a choice to give away in order to receive. My prayer for each one of us today is that we may have the courage to be followers of Jesus, to deny ourselves and to live our lives for God, knowing that in doing so, we will find something so much greater. And that in those times when that decision is hard and demanding a great deal of us, we may know the strength that Jesus showed as he looked to his own future, knowing what was to come and be able to join him in saying, not my will, but yours be done. Amen.
Almighty God, we continue to pray for all the key workers and NHS staff who continue to put themselves and their families at risk whilst maintaining our vital services and to all those who deliver care and treatment to the people who are suffering. We also pray that everybody remains vigilant and keeps to government guidelines and advice as we continue to fight against the pandemic <coughs> and to reduce infection rates. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Loving God, our thoughts and prayers are with all the children returning to schools this September, especially those who are starting their new schools. We pray that they keep healthy and happy as they resume to education and rejoice that they can return to normal school life and the friendships that they have missed. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Lord God, we thank you for our local community and village of Wheat Hampstead. We are truly grateful for all the amenities, services and opportunities our wonderful community provides. And we thank you for our local churches, St Helens and St Peter's, their church leaders, volunteers and congregation. <coughs> we ask you to keep all of us within your boundless love and grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. And gracious Lord, we thank you for the love, grace and care which you offer so freely and unconditionally. And we pray for your church throughout the world, especially for those Christians who are persecuted because of their faith, and to all those who have to worship in secrecy in, for fear of their safety. Help all to be courageous and keep them safe within your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Dear Creator God, we pray for all the countries that are experiencing conflicts, social and political unrest, in particular the people in Lebanon, Lebanon and Belarus. We hope that the leaders and people in power can find the resolve and wisdom to reach peace solutions to their problems. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for the health and well-being of our community, families and those living alone, local businesses and all who may be experiencing difficulties and struggling at this unprecedented time. We also think about the youth who have recently received their education results and hope they make the right decisions as they contemplate their future. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Finally, Lord God and Father to all, we would like to offer our gratitude for the wonderful planet which you have made and given to us. Help us to protect its most precious ecosystems by giving us the inspiration and desire to nurture your creation rather than exploiting its resources for our own gains. Merciful Father, accept these, these prayers, prayers for the, the sake, sake of, of your, your Son, Son our Saviour, Saviour Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
We've heard in our service this morning a challenge. Archdeacon Jane has challenged us about the choices that we're making in our life and how much we are aligning our life with the life of God. Um, she presents us with a challenge of um, following our own way or choosing the abundant life that God offers us. And that language of abundant life is picked up in today's collect, the collect for the 12th Sunday after Trinity, which I'd like you to join in with me now. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray and to give more than either we desire or deserve. Pour down upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us for those things of which our conscience is afraid and giving us those good things that we are not worthy to ask, but through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Archdeacon Jane gave us three points to help us to, to, to focus on the idea of the challenge that Jesus issues to Peter and to us. She talks about the values of Jesus's life and about aligning our lives with those values. She talks about prayer and she talks about speaking to others, talking to others about the choices that we are making um, to check whether we're in line with God's, God's life and, or not. I think it's relatively easy to do the first two at the moment. We can check our lives against the values of the gospel by reading the gospel. Um, we can pray um, and I hope that um, some of you will take the opportunity perhaps to join us for morning prayer. Um, which meets on Zoom every day of the week bar Friday. But it's a bit more difficult to do the talking part in our current situation because we're not meeting regularly. But I hope that you will take the opportunity to perhaps contact one of our ministry team if you feel that that would help you. We can talk with you and pray with you in confidence, either in person we can meet in the church building here, um, socially distanced if that suits you, or we can talk and pray with you over the phone. But do take that opportunity if you would like to speak to a member of our ministry team. Although our rector is away, the church is still operating. Um, so please do that if you feel you would like to. Also, um, we've been studying the book of Acts during uh, morning prayer over the last week or so. And I've been reminded about um, the fact that the early church had no needy people amongst them. It tells us that there was no one needy in the early church because as the early Christians um, were blessed by God um, and as they um, sold property that belonged to them, houses and lands, they brought the money, they um, offered it to the disciples and it was distributed to those in need. And we'd like our church in Wheat Hampstead to reflect those values of the early church. So at the end of our morning service, you'll see um, two numbers on the screen. One is a number that you can contact if you would like to give via St. Helens Church um, to the work of our community. And the other number is if you are in need, if you are, if you are somebody who has a need in your life that you can't meet at the moment, please contact us, we would love to help you. There are at least three sources of funding that we can put you in touch with, particularly if you're looking to buy things for your children as they start the new term at school. We'd love to be able to help you with that if that's something you feel you would need. Let's be a community that has no needy people amongst us. So as we come to the end of the service, let's share the blessing together. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.